uh, Professor Debbie. It's obviously been a great privilege to have you here, ma'am. Uh, we are definitely not gods. I, I, I surely don't feel like one. So we must have data. But we must also have data because there's another quote from management guru, Dr. Deming, who said that if you don't have data, then you're just another person with an opinion. And if we really wanted to change decision making, whether at policy or at operational levels, then we do need to have that kind of a push. Now, all that we've heard uh, today, which is, and some of us who work in this sector have been using CRED and MDAT data for years. We were, we were citing you way before uh, many of us ever met you. So, so it's, it's great uh, to see these uh, trends and the curves, global figures, regional figures. But what does it really mean to us and our work if we were to try and get this down to improving our, our impacts uh, right from this year? What would all of this mean for us if we were to say, hey, how do we improve our performance in the floods in 2018 as agencies and individuals that prepare for uh, and respond to uh, emergencies across the country? And so the report that we are talking about today, and we have copies here, so please, uh, at the end of this, do carry uh, your copy back. We will be doing a soft copy uh, sharing also in coming times. We are calling this uh, decoding the monsoon flood because Obviously, most of the flooding impact that is coming to our uh, sub-region that, uh, that you've just heard about is coming from the monsoon floods. So, so decoding the monsoon floods in these four countries of uh, Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, and Nepal. Uh, while this just comes up, uh, let me start with uh, a few stories, you know, of where we've responded uh, in recent times. and and what we are trying to capture here as the human face uh, of these disasters that we are talking about. So one of the major uh, responses we did in recent years was uh, Uttarakhand, the floods of Uttarakhand in uh, 2013. And uh, one of the cases that we have uh, with us is of a woman from uh, Rudraprayag, where we were responding. Uh, and she sat there and spoke to us about uh, about uh, uh, that's the woman Rajeshi I'm talking about. Uh, this is Rudra Payag. This is a relief camp in a school. She's she's sitting in the veranda. The the family's living out of here, and she's talking about how in this flash flood she could just see the uh, the wave of water come. It first took away their house, then it took away their agricultural field. And as you would be aware, in in the mountains these are stepped fields, very small land holdings very fragile boundaries to their fields. They go very quickly. So, so the house gone, the, the basic means of livelihood, the land that they tell gone. And then they're in the relief camp and then the waterborne diseases hit. So her children are, are unwell. Uh, and that's, that's the situation we met her in. Now, you know, whatever data we talk about gives you one static figure. You talk about, you know, uh, um, numbers of people and number of events, but what that single event can do to a single person and how complex, how complex that impact is, uh, is something that only comes when you start seeing these human faces of disasters, right? So, uh, we've already heard from Debbie that floods make up the highest number of disasters. We are now using, with CRED's help, we are using very, you know, it's just out of the oven data, it's still, uh, some of these are provisional figures, but we are sharing with you data from 2017. This is data just like 19 days old, right? And if you want to quantify this and qualify this with statements, if you look at figures of these four countries from the year 2000 to 2017, this millennium, and if you look at the figure of floods, that's 232 events. Now, uh, we've already heard that classification happens, this is the broadest classification, and then it goes on qualifying as you, as you unravel this. But if you look at the second highest number of events, which is 129 storms, a bulk of these are actually cyclones, cyclonic storms. And cyclonic storms, the, the way they impact people is actually flooding because there's a lot of water uh, that's coming from the rainfall, and there is storm surges coming in. Now, if you add these two, 232 and 129, that's 361 events across these four countries. That's three times of all the other disaster events put together. And that's the focus that, you know,
is required which we often miss because the media captures events like earthquakes uh, far, far better and in a more highlighted way. And this is where earthquakes, you can see where are earthquakes. Earthquakes are at 22 uh, events as compared to the 361. So we're talking about 15 times more over here. Uh, we've heard a bit about uh, the trend, uh, but within the trend there are these cycles, you know, and we see these ups if we broaden this horizon, if we go further back, uh, as was there in, in the CRED data we just saw, then you see these cycles where two or three years come and, and, and they move the, the averages up or down. But uh, we, we talk about these uh, averages. Now from here, from the numbers, let's move to this bar that I spoke about, which is actually cyclones, right? And this is, this is a, a woman called Polo Dasi. This is in the southern Bangladesh, uh, another area that, that we worked at in the last few years. This is where, this is where the Safer Communities Innovation Lab uh, that Manu spoke about is right now working. And she's, she's narrating what she saw happen during Cyclone Isla in 2009. Now if you, if you recollect, Isla and Filene are cyclones and Sidhar that we talk about as success stories. Because over the last 25, 30 years, these events tell us how, how through efforts of governments, uh, of civil society and people themselves, how with improved communication technology, number of deaths have really come down. But even after having come down, the impacts that you hear from people like Polo Dasi are talking about when they see people just going down in front of their eyes, they lose family members, they lose children in that form. Now, so what happened in, in Isla to her village and the farmland was that this water came in, there were, there were deaths directly due to drowning. Cyclone deaths are primarily due to drowning, not wind. So you know, as opposed to a general perception that we have sitting here, that cyclone and, and you generally track wind speeds, it's actually the water that's gonna cause the maximum damage. And not only in terms of drowning, what happens here that she's talking about is that then this, the, the embankments breach and the seawater comes in. And now again, agriculture, which is the lifeline for these people, and their, their lands are now completely inundated with sea, salt water. And when, when the water recedes, the farms are left behind literally as salt pans. And how do you grow in that? So the impact may appear on our charts only as an event over a year with, with reduced uh, casualties, but what happens to their farms will take years to recover. And that's the kind of, you know, the, the complexity of these impacts that we often miss out when we look at uh, data in a very sterile manner. And the lesson we draw from here is that flooding is a complex event with multiple inputs. We've talked about uh, storm-induced floods. We are also covering a few uh, flooding events in this report which happen because there's a sudden release of water from a dam. And, and we are losing, uh, uh, colleagues who are working in Uttarakhand would know this really well, that we lose a number of lives every year because there's sudden discharges of water that happens. For the locals, that is flooding, right? And so there's various inputs that is leading to these floods. The nature of floods is changing, and floods are having these various impacts. You have drowning deaths, you have uh, loss of uh, farmland, you have long-term damage to farmland, you have waterborne diseases, and, 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 and the story goes on. If we look at, we've disaggregated this for the four countries that we are talking about. If you look at Bangladesh, uh, the share is the largest. 51% of the events in these last 18 years were storms, 29% were floods. Put together, that's 80% of the total events recorded. What's interesting is if we've mapped, we haven't mapped the storms, we're mapping the floods here. And, and a surprise, as against our opinion, when data tells us uh, facts, the surprise is that we are finding a lot more events happening in the north it's not in the delta region. We are having far more events in the hill tracts of North Bangladesh. And that's something that can inform policy and response for people like us really well. If you move to India, that's now floods is 55% and storms is 22%. So 77% of all our events, as we've kind of already heard. We saw a version of the map which showed us uh, this distribution. Now we are, we are giving you an average uh, uh, so if you look at the mean that has happened over these 18 years, every single district of India has, on an average, seen 11 flood events. 98% right? of the districts have seen at least one flood event. So it's widespread and it's really recurrent. 
and, and we are seeing the distribution over here. If you look at the case of Myanmar, again, we are having, that's the Irrawaddy Delta region, you are having flood concentrations in the delta, but again, there's a huge concentration that's happening in the mountains. And as we know, the nature of floods in a delta region and a mountain region is completely different. Uh, the way the water flows, the duration of the flooding, the way, the time that it stays and the, and the rate at which it flows is very different. These are different floods that you need to deal with. So floods are of various kinds and that's the spread we are getting. Yeah. Uh, if you look at Nepal, it's 49% floods, storms is down because there's no cyclones coming from the oceans, but the landslide share has suddenly gone up. This is the only country that is showing up 26% landslide. A bulk of these are wet landslides. They are, they are rainfall triggered landslides. And the, the distribution is, is mostly the Tarai region. So again, if you want to disaggregate by provinces and by districts, there's, there's very rich data here which tells you that if this is the average of the last 18 years, where should we be preparing ourselves and focusing our limited resources for 2018? So we spoke about uh, deaths. Let's, let's, uh, so we did one more round of uh, analysis on that and, and if we, actually average them out over the period, then you have somewhere close to uh, 2,000 deaths that we are recording in an average year, right? And the fluctuations are high, uh, uh, but at the same time they, uh, and the, the spike you see there is actually coming from the Uttarakhand floods that I just spoke about, right? Uh, but as, as an average, it, it's kind of, is a very slight movement, it's almost static, but if you load on this, the population changes, the demographics. So now what we are doing is we are taking MDAT data from CRED and we are taking census data from all these four countries and we are saying where the population has moved. So, so, so if you see population that has moved up from about one point, a little over 1.2 billion, it has gone up to close to 1.45 billion. And if you, if you now average this across the population, we actually see a decline. And the decline is very clear. It, it may be, it may appear small. So from 138 persons per million in 2001, we've gone down to 117 persons per million. So it's not, you know, and that, actually that's good news because it's not that all our work in the past few years has gone a waste. We are, we are making a dent, but it's almost like running to stand still. It's great we are running because otherwise we would have been slipping back on this, right? Now the problem, this is clear, but the problem comes that when you talk about uh, the damages in these four countries. Now, as uh, Professor Debbie had just said, data is very scarce, right? And we've again taken two data sets. We've taken damage data sets, that is damage that has been recorded. And we've taken estimate data sets of what the overall impact has been. We are taking that again from Unicri, who's using your data to, but that's a very rigorous, very robust methodology. So very credible data sets. Now, now we can talk about, so that, so in these four countries in the last 18 years, uh, oh, now we're coming down to just the 2017 floods. Let's focus on that. Mm -hmm. So $352,000 is the, is the reported uh, damage. And the estimate that we are getting from uh, Munich Re is $3.5 billion. Load that with a global scenario where we're talking about 41% of losses being insured losses, which means 60% of global losses are uninsured losses. When you come to these four countries, more than 99% of the losses are off the radar. We are reporting a fraction of a percent as, as damages. Right? Now, if these are losses in this domain, then, then imagine if, if more than 99% of the losses are uninsured, and the assumption then flows that they're private, and they're in the informal sector. And so the conclusion has been that insured losses are negligible. It's not even worth counting that figure, right? And at the same time, we'll cover later that at the same time, just in India, we've lost 1.2 million houses this year. That's, that's physical infrastructure, houses being lost. Where, where is that showing in our data? So there's a lot that is happening below our graphs that we really need to work on cap and capture through volunteerism, through crowdsourcing of data, and improved resolution of our, you know, national, subnational data sets. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, again, uh, we're back to the fact that it's not just, we often remember uh, floods from the large events that have happened. You know, they're the ones that get recorded in our reports and in our, in our anecdotes. I've already told you that there's uh, 11 uh, flood events that India is recording on an average 
over a district for these last 18 years. But while, while the terrain is very similar, if we compare Nepal, Bangladesh and Myanmar, the recording is about five to six events. And now we don't have, uh, now we have an opinion. And our opinion is that in these smaller countries, we are not capturing data well enough. Because there is no reason why on this side of the boundary, the events are over a period of 18 years, way higher than the other side of the boundary over, an, over a very narrow strip. So we've disaggregated to district level and then we are looking at these data sets, right? Uh, let's look at variation, you know. So this is a map of standard variation. So we are trying to see how much of a variation comes uh, across districts and how is the predictability being affected by that? So, so the browns that you see are, are districts, and you see large parts of straits, uh, states in chunks that are very closely aligned to the national average of 11 disaster events over 18 uh, years. Now, now, these are places where taking preparatory action is going to be relatively easier because state policies can align to national policies and to resource allocation and to plans. Now the deviation comes in place. If you go to the northeast, we're looking at Assam, which was one of the hotspots in the in the maps uh, when we looked at events also. But on standard deviation, Assam is giving us. We take the example of Lakhimpur, which is a district in Assam that has flooded 31 times in the last 18 years. That's almost two flood events, two major recorded flood events in a year, right? So that's, that's where stuff is happening a lot and we need to, we need to sort of uh, you know, put some thought there. And then we come to Leh, right in the north, right? Leh is, is on the deviation map, is showing closer to the mean. But what that means is we all would remember Leh from the 2010 floods, the flash floods. Amir Khan also went there and, and the whole diaspora came in and a lot of work was done, right? Some of us who've been working in this sector for many years would also remember the 2006 floods. We had responded, Sphere had responded, uh, and there had been coordination meetings around that. Uh, but if you go through the records, you will learn that in these last 18 years, Leh has seen nine major floods. Leh is the cold desert, you know, part of our country. We don't, we don't, we don't perceive that that's an area that would be throwing up many floods. 2010, in our view, in our opinion, was an anomaly. Data is telling us that that is the norm. You know, every alternate year, Leh is flooding. If you move to the western part of the country, look at Rajasthan and uh, Gujarat. Rajasthan is Thar Desert. Desert, this is the countryside where, where, where uh, the ship of the desert, the camel roams, right? You don't, you don't get floods there. And again, we would recall 2006, Barmer floods was an anomaly. It was an unprecedented anomaly, the only time in 200 years. Data tells you that Rajasthan has the same mean as, as the rest of the country. Rajasthan has seen 11 flood events in the last 18 years. Gujarat is deviating above the mean. Gujarat has seen 15 flood events in the last 18 years. So, so when it floods in Surat, it's not an anomaly. We are not rushing to do something, you know, respond to a very odd situation. Gujarat is flooding more than the average, average state or district of the country. And that includes the district of Kutch, which we again note you know, it's known to be the salt desert, the, the run of Kutch. And that's why we're seeing this. So, so it's uh, the perception uh, versus reality thing plays out really, really strong over here. Let's talk a little bit about the urban centers. We are, we are all, you know, city dogs. We live in, in, in a good life in these cities. If you look at cities, what we try to do here is we map, we map the districts which are above the mean. So districts that are giving more than 11 flood events in the last 18 years, since 2000. And we mapped the cities, uh, the census towns and cities over there. And more than 2,200 cities fall in districts that are showing more than mean flooding, right? Uh, that's still a lot of averaging, but let's look at uh, smart cities. That's a flagship program for the country. We're all very proud of it. More than half, 56% of smart cities fall in very high vulnerability. Uh, districts from the point of view of floods alone. We are not even looking at earthquakes and other things right now. That's where we are putting huge investments in place right now. So it's not just about investing for response and preparedness, but it's investing to secure your investments that you're making as flagship investments, you know, for the sector. Uh, back to Dhaka, uh, this is where uh, the lab is working. If you look at how Dhaka has grown over 19, from 1989 uh, till recently, that's how the land mass is moving. A higher resolution analysis of this spatially tells us that it's all ponds, lakes, marshy lands that have been taken up. And, and this is the curve on which the flooding, uh, 
really goes up. It's exactly the same story that we see for so many cities that have gone underwater in recent years. Srinagar being one, Bhopal this uh, 2017, Chennai, Mumbai in 2005. It's not an odd story. It's a recurrent story. It's a story that's going to increase in its, uh, in its severity as well as its frequency. So if you're going to talk about preparing for the 2018 floods, let's look at some of these maps and some of these trends. The other thing that's happening with this is uh, on the same pattern, we are uh, in our research in Bangladesh, we are finding these reports of very high uh, problems coming up around heat. And that's coming in this settlement. This is Korail, uh, a slum in the heart of uh, Dhaka, where so the lab physically sits on the left edge, where you see the last clump of uh, these green shed houses. That's that's where the, the that's where the Safer Communities Lab actually sits. Uh, and when we started working here, with the assumption that we're going to hear a lot about flooding and cyclones and problems in slums, we are hearing a lot more about heat. Because taking care of all of these things, they've gone on, gone on building with tint and shed, first in roofs, then tin walls, uh, in floors. And now, now just the urban heat combined with the micro level uh, parameters over here is throwing heat as a major issue. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the context uh, that, that the lab is in. And let me finally come to also the issue of uh, people with special needs and what's happening under the radar. So, what we try to do with, again, with MDAT data for, uh, for, for this year, for 2017 floods, and we try to look at the census data on these worst affected districts on persons with disabilities. And that tells us that of the 15 million plus people affected by floods, that's the official record for 2017, more than 300,000 are persons with disabilities. You know, and we, when we plan, we've all been in that boat. When we plan, we always say, oh, if there's going to be a relief camp, let's make sure there's a room for, you know, or there's a ramp somewhere and, and there's a room for pregnant and lactating women and all. Look at the scale of this, this you know, people with special needs that we are talking about. And, and a lot of these needs are very visible needs. You can say that, okay, you need a, you know, these are locomotor, very physical kind of uh, disabilities. But many of these disabilities are invisible. You don't see them when you see a person. So you don't see them in a relief camp. Many of these, uh, these disabilities are invisible in a, in a normal situation where we are doing disaster preparedness plans because these people don't move around. You don't see them. These children don't come to school very often. They stay at home. They, they are out of the net because it's very difficult for them to even reach school. So when we say that, you know, the census figure tells us that in these worst affected districts as an average, 2.04% of the population is persons with disabilities. The disability groups argue that it's way more than that. Let's even stick with this much. We don't see that percentage when we go to the schools. We don't see that percentage on bus stops, on railway stations. We don't see them on the roads. That's where invisibility in our data sets needs to be picked up and, and worked upon. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, finally, to the lab itself, the work that, that we are trying to initiate through these engagements with people like yourselves is around how the built environment, that's where SEEDS works, and health, that's where the public school uh, in Brussels work, and that's where CRED comes from. What is the relationship between the built environment and these health parameters that we are seeing in emergencies, but will also be valid equally in times of peace, in times of, in, in the terms of health problems that these people face. So that's the core of the lab, the interface of the health uh, of health with the built environment, with the hypothesis that a large chunk of the root causes for health problems, both in emergencies and normal times, lie in the built environment. In the way we plan our cities, you saw 2,200 plus cities in the worst uh, flood zones. Be also aware that of the 7,900 plus cities in India, about a fourth have any kind of a developmental plan or master plan. Three-fourths of our urban centers are growing without master plans. They're just growing on their own. There is no developmental planning happening there. So that's where, that's where root causes will lie. Otherwise, we'll just be running to you know, put band-aids on problems that appear, on wounds that appear. But if we really want to avoid these wounds, and then we need to get back to the, to the built environment and those spaces. I've already mentioned there's 1.2 million houses are being lost, and they don't appear anywhere on our, they don't appear as a bump on our GDP anywhere. They don't appear in our data sets. They don't appear in our insurance data. Insurance, insured losses are negligible. Where's all that loss going? Right. So now uh, in Corail, what we are what we are trying to trigger and trigger for the region with these four countries is 
where do local innovation sit and local data sit in this? Local data to improve our resolution, but local innovations to also help find problems uh, that are being answered locally and, and how these local answers can be scaled up. So local answers can be scaled up through local innovation. And these people have found a way where they're using garbage in bags as rafts where, where uh, other means of uh, transportation are not working. They're finding innovations, if we do these innovation walks in Corail, they're finding innovation in the way they do the doors and shutters to their shops and their houses, which are multi-purpose things. They, they trap water, they provide security. They're finding ways in very efficient ways of storing material, but also water. They're finding uh, ways of doing very efficient uh, handling of, oops, uh, 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 wastewater. Uh, the pipe networks that run in Corail are absolutely amazing. You don't assume that kind of stuff will be happening there. And uh, back in India, I, one of my favorite shots, this is from uh, Supol in North uh, Bihar. And you know, this rod, uh, it just, every time I see this image, it reminds me of the dilithium crystals that Scotty used to run the USS Starship Enterprise. This is a fuel rod, no less important than Scotty's crystals. This is how they, they store and they stack fuel before the rains. Because when it rains, they will be evacuating their land and moving to embankments and high places. And the one thing that they won't have is fuel. They may get uh, rations in relief, but they'll need to cook and they'll need fuel. And that's how fuel is stored, which will then be carried to relief camps or their own, own movement to, to higher ground. Right? And this is again the place, uh, not too far away from Delhi, but, but unknown to us, where summer vacations are staggered by a few weeks. And they are not called Garmi Ki Chutti, they are called Bar Chutti, which literally means flood vacations. It's a state and a community that has learned so well to live with floods that they have, that they have uh, you know, vacations aligned to floods. It's, it's, it's how they deal with it. So instead of having a very uh, westernized cowboy approach to responding to disasters, I think what our data and our human interest stories are telling us is that there are very local, nuanced, very mature ways of addressing these problems that we've just started to unravel. And that's where, uh, that's where a lot of excitement will lie. And that's where a lot of answers will lie for us if we really mean to uh, figure out how we respond better to the monsoons of uh, 2018. And the cover shot on this is actually Cyclone Oki approaching uh, uh, the western coast, Mumbai and Gujarat, just a few weeks ago. And uh, that's the membership of the lab. But uh, this is something that we are really keen, this is very early days. And this is where the engagement with all of you is really key to us uh, to figure out how we can do this better. This is, this is something that cannot be done without collaborations. And that's what we hope to set rolling through this event. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Uh, our guest speaker of the day, Professor Debbie, is here with us. And the floor is now open for any questions, uh, any suggestions, any thoughts you may have on what you've seen this morning or what you foresee for the monsoons of 2018. Thank you very much.